Next on the news, a flooding disaster in Kentucky taking another heart-wrenching turn. The death toll is rising and dozens remain missing, but the diocese there is out in full force to help. Statewide, there are 70 approximately agencies, Catholic Charities of Lexington and others, coordinating with the disaster relief. New York City declaring a state of emergency as the monkeypox virus continues to spread. Pope Francis is back at the Vatican following his trip to Canada, but he still has a lot to say about his journey. Plus, married couples in the Diocese of Brooklyn will soon have an opportunity to celebrate with a special mass, how you can take part. I'm Emily Druby in for Christine Persichetti. Currents News starts right now. The full magnitude of a flooding disaster in Kentucky is yet to be realized. Five days after the tragedy struck, hundreds are still missing and the death toll is rising. One thing that is for sure, the outpouring of support. The governor is on the ground and houses of worship are doubling up as shelters for those with no place to go. Good evening. As of Monday afternoon, the death toll stands at 35 and with so many people missing, it's expected to rise. Now the threat of more bad weather is pushing an already devastated community to the brink. There are hundreds of unaccounted for people minimum and we just we just don't have a firm grasp on that. Hundreds of people vanished. Unprecedented flooding in Kentucky, leaving families without answers. Dozens of lives lost and more could follow. Among the dead, four young siblings, just eight, five, four, and two years old. The whole family clung to a tree for safety, but the rushing waters proved too strong. Their bodies were found the next day. Even drove by and got out of the site where those four kids were swept away. Uh, I've had to do a lot of things that are hard as governor, and that was certainly um, one of the the hardest basketball hoops sticking up from the flood water show just how high the water reached and the destruction is everywhere. The governor predicting there could be hundreds of millions of dollars in damage. Those on the front line say the situation is as dangerous as ever. It's chaos uh, at times just trying to, you know, maneuver through the trees, the down power line. The power lines are probably the most dangerous thing that we have to uh, avoid. The flood waters destroying bridges, leaving many communities isolated. We need so much help here. It is unbelievable. We're five days in this. There's no internet. There's no power. And a lot of places they say we won't have water for months. Joining us now to talk about how the church is helping in the relief efforts in Kentucky is Edward Bauer, director of communications for the Diocese of Lexington. Welcome, Edward. Thank you very much. Now, Edward, homes, offices, and communities have been destroyed. Power and electricity is out. Roads are impassable, impassable. Even your governor called it one of the worst, most devastating flooding events in state history. Can you describe what you've been hearing? Yes. Uh, first of all, thank goodness uh, our uh, churches and other uh, properties haven't been damaged. Water in the basement, a few places, that kind of thing. But the areas surrounding the churches have been devastated. Um, homes lost, uh, people have lost possessions. Um, it, it's just been, you know, last year we had flooding in the same areas. I'm told in some areas it's 10 times worse this year. Oh, so less than 1% of the population in eastern Kentucky is Catholic. However, the church is an essential part of the community as the only food pantries in some areas. In your own words, can you tell us why the Catholic Church is such an important part of this community? The parishes uh, give out food baskets, um, I mean, boxes of food, bags of food, uh, pay utility bills uh, for people um, on an as-needed basis in a lot of cases. But we do have some uh, food pantries, permanent food pantries that give out food once a week, twice a week in some cases. Um, it's just because of the generosity of the people of the Diocese of Lexington that we are able to be one of the main providers of services in these areas. Uh, statewide, there are 70 approximately agencies cooperating, nonprofits, churches, uh, Catholic Charities of Lexington, and others coordinating with the disaster relief. 
And as you mentioned, you are going to be so crucial in, in dealing with this storm and the damage and just the absolute destruction to people's lives. Now, your storm has some flooded, your church has some flooded basements, but nothing too crazy. Has anything else prevented your team from helping those in need? Well, it's just access. Uh, some of the areas, the roads are completely washed out. Um, for example, I was speaking with the lady who's the parish life director in uh, Hazard, uh, at Mother of Good Counsel in Hazard, Kentucky. Um, they're up on a hill, but the city all around them is uh, is filled with water, it flooded. And um, I wasn't even sure, I haven't heard from her today, uh, they weren't even sure that the priest who comes in to say mass on the weekend was able to, was going to be able to get there. Um, so the roads are in very bad shape. And that's one of the things that we're uh, most worried about is trying to find a place to deliver a central point to deliver the materials that are needed uh, so it can be distributed um, to those around. Uh, but that's been one of the one of the challenges. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. We are praying for you here in Brooklyn. Edward Bauer, Director of Communications for the Diocese of Lexington. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. We appreciate the prayers. With more rain and hot temperatures in the days ahead, the people of Kentucky can use all the help they can get. If you'd like to help, then head online to catholiccharitieslexington.org and click on Disaster Services to donate. From devastating flooding to raging wildfires, the McKinney Fire in Northern California has exploded in size, growing into the state's largest fire so far this year. The fast moving fire started in Klamath National Forest Friday, and by Saturday, it quickly scorched 52,000 acres. No deaths or injuries have been reported, but the fire has destroyed over 100 structures and has forced the evacuation of about 3,000 people. In New York, Mayor Eric Adams declared monkeypox a public health emergency. The mayor, along with health officials, called New York City the epicenter of the nation's monkeypox outbreak. As of Monday, there were more than 1,400 cases in the city, or about 28% of the nation's case count. Adams warned that as many as 150,000 New Yorkers may be at risk of exposure. The local state of emergency allows Adams to suspend local laws and enact rules as necessary to protect the well-being and health of all New Yorkers. We are pivoting and shifting based on the crises that are coming to our city and country. And others look at what we're doing and they commend what we're doing. The move comes after New York Governor Kathy Hochul declared a disaster emergency in response to the outbreak. Here's what to look out for. Monkeypox symptoms usually start appearing within two weeks of close contact with someone who has had the virus. They most commonly include itchy, painful rashes or sores that can either appear all over the body or on certain parts such as the hands, feet or face. People have also been known to experience flu like symptoms, including fevers, swollen lymph nodes, headaches or tiredness. Most cases clear up on their own. But if you think you may be infected, you need to consult with your doctor. If you're a lead foot driver, then you better watch out. New York City roads are now under 24 hour surveillance. On Monday, Mayor Eric Adams flicked the switch on the city's 2000 speed cameras, allowing them to run all day, every day. Previously, they only operated on weekdays between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. The goal is to help eliminate traffic related deaths and serious injuries, which officials say mostly happen on weekends and late at night. She played a role in taking audiences on a journey to the final frontier. The actress best known for playing Lieutenant Uhura in the original Star Trek TV series has died. While she was celebrated by fans for her out of this world performance, history will also remember her for blazing a path here on Earth. Security sweeps of all decks are negative, Mr. Spock. Before Nichelle Nichols broke barriers on board the USS Enterprise as Lieutenant Uhura, she was dancing and singing her way across the stages of New York City and Chicago, the city close to where she grew up, Robbins, Illinois. In 1967, she released a cover of the Joe McCoy classic, Why Don't You Do Right, on Epic Records. Get out of here. 
But it was playing Star Trek's Lieutenant or Horror where she really found fame. It was a groundbreaking role for an African American woman in 1966, widely considered one of the first times a woman of color was not portraying a servant on TV. Horror was the chief communications officer and fourth in command on board the Enterprise. I didn't find out that it was fourth in command till the second season. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody told me. <laughs> but it, it was um it was something you look forward to yeah. doing every morning. Nichols actually thought about leaving after the first season. The show's creator, Gene Roddenberry, begged her to stay. But it was an influential fan that finally convinced her, Martin Luther King. He said, you can't. Oh. D don't you know who you are? Hmm. To our movement, to everyone who's, you are there in the 23rd century. You've created a role that has such dignity and everything. It's powerful. You cannot leave. He told me many other things, like this is one of the only shows that I, Coretta and I allow our little children to stay up and watch. That's terrific. Though. So I went back in, uh, the next um, Monday morning, told Gene, and he said, God bless Dr. Martin Luther King. Somebody sees what I'm trying to achieve. <laughs> Another landmark for the show during the turbulent 60s, the first scripted interracial kiss on national television in 1968. We had heard rumors that the southern stations, uh, some southern stations might, might cut it down. It changed television forever and it also changed um, the way people looked at one another. Um, if they, their fa two of their favorite actors, um, can battle through it and come through it on top. Why can't everybody? That was Jason Carroll reporting. Star Trek ended in 1969, but it endured for years in syndication and in several other movies. Nichols worked with NASA to increase diversity in the space program. She was a practicing Presbyterian. Nichelle Nichols was 89. President Biden tested positive again for COVID-19 on Monday. The president's physician, Dr. Kevin O'Connor, tested positive on an antigen test earlier in the morning. O'Connor says Biden feels well and will continue to isolate until he tests negative again. The president took Pavlo Paxlovid and his doctors say this is likely a case of COVID-19 positivity after taking the drug. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has kicked off a high-profile trip to Asia with a visit to Singapore. Pelosi is seen here meeting with the Prime Minister on Monday. She also met with Singapore's Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister, and she tweeted, We discussed how our nations can continue to work together to advance security, prosperity, and opportunity for, both those, for those on both sides of the Pacific. Pelosi is lending a congressional is leading a congressional delegation to the region. She announced a possible stop in Taiwan, which drew critical remarks from China and a warning from President Biden to Pelosi. There's a lot more news headed your way after five days. Pope Francis is back at the Vatican, but he has a lot to say about his trip to Canada and why he may retire. Also, Bishop Robert Brennan starting the week with important advice for his flock and calling all married couples how you can make your anniversary extra special with some help from the Diocese of Brooklyn. He may be back home at the Vatican, but Pope Francis is still speaking about his trip to Canada and plans to keep talking about it. During his Sunday Angelus, the Holy Father took time to show gratitude to those who made the pilgrimage possible. Ringrazio di cuore quanto mi hanno accompagnato con la loro preghiera. Grazie a tutti. The pontiff also said he will talk about the trip further during his general audience on Wednesday. While the Holy Father wants to talk about the trip itself, many are still discussing the papal press conference he held on the plane on the way back. While answering questions by reporters, the Holy Father discussed the physical limitations he faced. Non credo che possa andare con lo stesso ritmo dei viaggi di prima, no? E... Credo che alla mia età e con, questo, con questa limitazione devo risparmiare un po' per poter servire la Chiesa o nel contrario pensare la possibilità di farmi da parte, no? questo con tutta onestà, no? 
non è una, una catastrofe, no? The Holy Father spent much of his trip in Canada in a wheelchair due to his knee pain. Also, during the press conference, the pontiff answered why they can't simply operate on the knee. L'intervento chirurgico al, al ginocchio non va, non va nel mio caso. I tecnici dicono di sì, ma eh, c'è tutto il problema dell'anestesia. Io ho subito dieci mesi fa più di sei ore di anestesia e ancora ci sono le tracce. Eh, non si gioca, non si scherza con l'anestesia, no? In the past, the Pope has blamed his knee pain on inflamed, strained, or torn ligaments, the latter of which he told an Italian newspaper he got therapeutic injections for in early May. Here to go deeper into what the Holy Father had to say on the papal plane is Crux Rome Bureau Chief Ines San Martin. Hi, Ines. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Now, we just heard Pope Francis mention his physical limitations on the papal plane, and the Holy Father also spoke about a possible resignation. Let's listen. Quello che il Signore dica. Il Signore può dire, dimettiti. È il Signore che comanda. Now, Inez, what does this mean for the future of the papacy? The fact that he's struggling to walk, that he's relying more and more on a wheelchair, a cane, or a walker, will mean that we will see Pope Francis slowing down, which will be, I'm pretty sure, hard for the energizer bunny of Pope. Um, so on the one hand, we will see him focusing more and more on the reform of the Roman Curia, that is the central government of the Catholic Church in the Vatican. And on the other hand, we'll probably see Pope Francis going back to what we saw during the pandemic, you know, more and more sending messages through video link and video footage so that he gets to still be close to the people. And in as Kazakhstan, Ukraine and South Sudan, all three of those are possible trips coming up. How could his health affect these and any future trips? I know you mentioned it, touched on it a little bit, but if we could go a little further into it now. Yeah, I, I think the one that will be the hardest for him to be able to fulfill due to health concerns is the one to South Sudan and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, I had the chance to talk to a lot of people in South Sudan before the Vatican announced that the July trip was going to be postponed. And their concern was that even the airport is not fully prepared to welcome a guest who relies on a wheelchair to move around. Um, so, you know, some concessions and some changes to the program might need to be made now, when it comes to Kazakhstan, um, we're going to see the Pope going to a Muslim-majority country. You know, there's a small Christian population, so there are no huge expectations of, you know, the Pope going to a stadium and saying mass to a great crowd. So that one is going to be a lot easier. Lastly, the trip to Ukraine, I think, there's a lot of concern regarding the Pope's safety and also the safety of the Ukrainians. Will Vladimir Putin retaliate? if the Pope does, in fact, visit Kiev. Now, and as turning back to Canada, the main point of the trip was Pope Francis's apology, which he delivered multiple times at various events. Now that the Pope has left, how can the Catholic Church carry out this apology in concrete actions? The Catholic Church in Canada has promised a $30 million um, compensation fund that they were hoping to raise through, you know, collections and with the help of the faithful in Canada. Um, on the other hand, something the Catholic Church in Canada has promised to work on with the Vatican um, at the explicit request of the indigenous population of Pope Francis went to visit um, was the repatriation, for calling it in some way, of um, hundreds of indigenous artifacts that are currently lodged in the Vatican Museum. These would be these two things would be relatively easy to accomplish and would bring a long way the, the you know the idea of putting into action the words the Pope delivered while he was in Canada last week. Incredible, Inez. Thank you so much for breaking down both those comments and the trip. Crux Rome Bureau Chief Inez San Martin, thank you for joining us. Thank you, it was my pleasure. The Pope's trip to Canada may be wrapped up, but the Vatican just confirmed that the pontiff will be boarding another flight, this time to Kazakhstan.
There, Pope Francis will attend an interreligious meeting in the capital from September 13th to the 15th. The Russian Orthodox Patriarch Kirill is also expected to attend. This could be the first time the two will see each other face to face since their first meeting in Cuba back in 2016 and since the start of the war in Ukraine. Still to come on Currents News, Monday is behind us now, but Bishop Robert Brennan still has some wise pastoral advice as we move through the rest of the week. We'll hear from him next. In saying I do all over again, couples will soon be able to celebrate their wedding anniversaries with Bishop Brennan. Details are ahead. Do you have a story idea or want to share a tip? Email us at newstips at desalesmedia.org or call our 24-hour number 718-517-3122. We'll be right back. The Bishop of Brooklyn is giving pastoral advice to best tackle the week. Posting his Sunday reflections online following this week's readings, Bishop Robert Brennan focused on our relationship with God. Actually, I think the Lord is asking us to think about what are the things we fight about? What are the things that tear us apart? After all, he's called us to himself. After all, he calls us to something greater than material goods. St. Paul tells the Colossians that, in a sense, we have died and our lives have been risen and are hidden with Christ in God. What great news that is. He asks the Colossians to take off the old self and to put on this new self, that new self which is Christ, who is all in all. You can stay up to date on the Bishop's weekly reflections by following him on Facebook. A striking family portrait was unveiled Sunday at St. Joseph's Church in Astoria. The painting called The Rest of the Holy Family shows Mary, Joseph and baby Jesus resting on rocks. With an angel gazing from above as Joseph wraps his arms lovingly around Mary. The church's pastor commissioned an artist from Milan for the image and the cost of the art was covered by a single parishioner. The painting was blessed during mass on Sunday. Calling all married couples, the Diocese of Brooklyn is honoring the sacred sacrament of matrimony with a special mass this September. All husbands and wives, regardless of anniversary year, are welcome to come to Resurrection Ascension Church in Regal Park to renew your wedding vows. Bishop Brennan will be the main celebrant. For more information on the event and how to register, just contact Christine Georgie at 718-281-9540 or email cgeorgie at diobrook.org. They haven't been seen recently in the waters off Northern California, but now there's a federal plan to reintroduce sea otters to San Francisco Bay. It's believed the otter's presence could actually help the climate. Scientists say their numbers have been dwindling because great white sharks have been keeping them out. But a new study by U.S. Fish and Wildlife says they could be reintroduced in San Francisco Bay and it would benefit the environment. They're almost like environmental engineers bringing back um, areas like the Elkhorn Slough down, down the coast to a really healthy place. Environmental officials say the replacement of the sea otters in the bay won't happen overnight. The report recommends more studies, experiments and outreach to the public. And finally tonight, news about our current news family member, Jessica Easthope. Her baby daughter, Violet, was baptized by Monsignor David Casado at St. Athanasius Church in Bensonhurst. Jessica, along with her husband, Jerome, Violet's godparents, family and friends were all present for the blessed day. Violet is so adorable. Congratulations and God bless to all. And that is Currents News. I'm Emily Druby. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.